，欢迎大家参加《世界日报》举办的二零二一年春季线上教育讲座。我们有请到 Admission Master 升学规划教育机构的执行长 Jenny Whitley， 他将为学生以及家长介绍二零二一年大学录取的一些趋势和一些经典的案例分析。Hello, World Journal. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today、um, for the 2021 College Admissions Trends Seminar.、Uh, during our seminar today, we're going to dive into the 2021 case studies、um, of students and what they did、uh, and what the trends look like this year. So, thank you so much for World Journal to World Journal for、uh, you know inviting us to be a part of this college fair and workshop this season.、Um, and yeah, let's go ahead and get started. So my name is Jenny.、Um, I am currently the、uh, president of Admission Masters.、Um, I've been working with Admission Masters for quite some time now, and I'm sure you guys have already seen me、uh, in previous seminars. But again, I'm super excited to be here.、Um, feel free to check out the QR code、um, for you to get some more information about our organization.、Um, if you want to sign up for free.、Um, Uh, first meetings or initial meetings and consultations、um, that we are giving to World Journal Seminar、um, attendees. Feel free to come and check us out、um, using the QR code. Otherwise, I'm really excited to start with uh, uh, you guys today. We also have the Hall Pass podcast,、um, which is a free online podcast、uh, for all of our students and parents who want to learn more about the college admissions process.、Uh, we're currently in our season four, and we're really excited to be sharing more information、um, every single. Month,、uh, but go ahead and check out the Hall Pass podcast、um, if you guys want to learn more about the college admissions process. So this year, college admissions has been really, really tough,、um, and I'm sure that a lot of people have kind of talked about this before. A lot of people have already heard from a, may, many different colleges how difficult、um, college admissions was this year. Well, unfortunately, college admissions is going to continue to be very challenging for the next few years, partially because of the pandemic、um, and how tough it's been because of the pandemic. Um, but also, you know, for several other reasons, and I want to share those reasons with you guys today. So first and foremost,、um, I wanted to show you guys the UC admissions. Now UC didn't come out with their complete data just yet,、um, but the UCs did come out with some data in regards to the applications that they received. So you'll notice here、um, for UCs、uh, specifically. There were way more Asian American, white, Latino, Black, you know, other ethnic group students who applied,、um, you know, to the UC schools, and even underrepresented groups, more students applied. So、uh, let me kind of show you. If it, it, basically what this means is, the more the students apply, the more challenging it is for admissions, and that's what trends kind of look like for 2021 and beyond. Now, if you look at UC Berkeley, just UC Berkeley, applicants by the number. UC Berkeley sees record high high school applicants. So this is the most high school applicants that they've ever had in the history of UC Berkeley's existence. A hundred existence, a hundred and twelve thousand eight hundred twenty-one applicants.、Um, you know that. Applied、uh, for 2021, you'll notice that of the underrepresented groups,、um, the Chicanx and Latinx、uh, community,、uh, you know, increased their applications by 29 percent. So 29 percent of more students in the Chicanx and Latinx community, Latinx communities,、um, applied to UC Berkeley. Berkeley, six more percent for、um, six more percent of Black applicants,、um, and then you'll see American Indian and Pacific Islander now. One really quick question that a lot of students and parents ask me when they look at look at this chart is, well, Jenny, how come Asian Americans are not in here? How come Asians are not among the、um, underrepresented groups?、Um, and you know, there's. You know, at the end of the day, we should be maybe underrepresented. We are considered to be minorities, but a lot of times when colleges do take a look at the numbers、um, of applicants, they kind of just focus、um, on these underrepresented groups specifically. So, I mentioned this, and I'm going to mention this again, but. 
that just means that things are going to be more competitive for Asian American applicants and Asian applicants altogether um, overall. And that's kind of one of the things that I really wanted to hit today is to talk about, you know, why it's becoming more difficult for Asian students in particular, and what do Asian students need to do in order to be more competitive? What do Asian students need to do to stand out and be more unique? So I'll talk about that towards the end of our seminar today. But again, just to look at some of these trends, first of all, record high number of applicants, record uh, number of underrepresented groups applying to college, which is amazing, but also at the same time uh, makes it very challenging for Asian American students as well. So um, let's dive into this a little bit more. Uh, so these are also applications by the number. And I just want to kind of uh, highlight a few numbers here. So if you look at, for example, um, maybe Harvard or uh, MIT or Yale, you'll see that, you know, before in 2021, about 10,000 um, students, uh, I'm sorry, in 2020, about 6,000 students applied to Harvard. In 2021, 10,000 students applied to Harvard early. So that's a huge increase in numbers. Now, now, with that being said, you'll also notice that, hey, but maybe this isn't necessarily for every single school, which that's true. You'll notice for schools like Johns Hopkins over here, um, you know, their, their uh, numbers didn't increase that much. Um, you'll also notice, you know, for, but for schools like MIT, 9,000 in 2020, number of applicants, 15,000 in 2021. So almost 6,000 more applicants who applied in 2021 this year compared to last year. Uh, you'll also see Columbia um, here had a, a bit of an increase. Um, Yale had a bit, a bit of an increase. Um, but then you'll see some of these other schools that didn't you know, increase too much in terms of early. But you'll see a lot of these early action schools where you don't have to commit to the school, right? You know that for early, there's early decision and there's early action. Well, Harvard and MIT are early action. Harvard is restrictive, but MIT is early action. These early action schools did see a huge increase um, in application. So what do you need to know about next Next year. I would highly recommend, which I, I'm telling my students right now too, but I would highly recommend that you apply to colleges if it is your top choice school or even in your top five to do early decision. Doing early decision, you can see with UPenn or Johns Hopkins or Duke, these schools with early decision programs where you are binded. And if you get accepted, you have to go no matter what. For these schools, there's actually a lot more, um, a, a lot less applicants applying, which which means that your chances of getting in would be higher, but also because it is binding, your chances would increase anyway. So um, taking a look at these applications by the number numbers, it's really important to recognize the differences um, between uh, what types of schools are seeing more applicants versus the ones that are not. So then we'll look at the acceptance rates for early. So this is just for early people who submitted November 1st and then found out um, December 15th or later. This is just for those applicants. So you'll see here um, for Harvard in 2020, they had 13.9%, 2019, 13.4% acceptance rate for early. This year, 7.4% acceptance for early, but that makes sense. You guys saw in the previous slide that there were let more students that applied. They have the same number um, of students that they can pretty much accept every year. So of course, the acceptance rate is going to look a lot lower. Let's look at MIT. Last year and the year before, 2020 and 2019, 7.4% acceptance rate for early. This year, 4.8% for acceptance rate early. So again, more applicants just means more, um, I mean, less uh, of a chance of getting accepted. More applicants, more comp competition. But even schools that have early decision still saw a decline in the number of acceptances. So Johns Hopkins, last year, 28% acceptance rate for early decision. This year, 19% acceptance rate for early decision, right? So still, you'll see that there is um, you know, a decrease. Some are a lot more drastic um, in terms of their changes, but you'll see that it's becoming more challenging. Now, of course, a lot of people are like, but why, Jenny? Why is it more challenging? Why is this happening, right? Well, like I said earlier, more people are applying. When more people apply, 
there's less of a chance of getting accepted. And we can talk about why more people apply in a minute. One of the things that you guys know for sure why people apply more is because a lot of colleges due to the pandemic are going test optional and test blind, which means they're not looking at your SAT or ACT score or they're saying, hey, it's optional for you to submit your SAT or ACT score. You don't have to submit it. And when that happens, students who have pretty decent GPAs, students who have pretty um, good um, academic records at school will more than likely try to apply to some of these colleges. So some students in the past, they're like, you know what, I'm not really good at the SAT or ACT. I have a pretty good GPA, but there's no way I can get uh, I can apply to Harvard because they're looking for SAT scores of, you know, 1550 and 1560. But now that Harvard and a lot of the Ivy Leagues went test optional or test blind, students who have pretty good grades are like, hey, I don't need a test score. Might as well throw in my application to Harvard and see what happens. And you know what? A lot of those students are getting accepted. Now that some of these Ivy League schools do not have to look at your test scores, they're focusing their attention on other areas to get to know you as a student. Now that they don't have the SAT or ACT to say, okay, the student doesn't have a good enough SAT or ACT score to get accepted into our program. Now that they, they don't look at that as much, they're looking at other things like teacher recommendations. They're looking at your essays a lot more carefully. They're looking at your extracurricular activities a little bit more in depth, right? They're, they're thinking about what type of students that they want to bring um, that are going to add value to their, their class and their school um, based on information outside of SAT and ACT. And unfortunately, there's many students who have that, right? There are athletes that couldn't study for the SAT or ACT before um, and now that it's test optional or test blind, they don't have to worry about that. And they can focus their energy on their talents. They can focus their energy on the things that they're great at. And that's sometimes what gets them accepted. So these are the reasons why things are becoming more challenging. Obviously, people who are more academically qualified because of their GPA are applying to colleges, making it overall more challenging um, for students to get accepted um, those students who would have just focused on their academics. Um, I also want to show you a little bit about Harvard. So um, Harvard, uh, you know, came out with an article that said they saw their lowest record, lowest historic record on lowest acceptance rate this year of 3.4%. I just wanted to highlight what the Harvard College admissions rate looks like based on the students that, you know, got accepted versus the applicants. So you'll see in this chart, these are the, um, these are the uh, applicants, the, uh, the, the long line is the number of applicants. And then this short little line right here um, on the graph are the students that got accepted. Um, and so you can see just how difficult it is and the more difficult and more challenging it's getting again, because the number of applicants are swelling. There's more students who are applying overall. So I wanted to share some other admissions rates with you as well. I mean, I think maybe just kind of focusing on the rate and this was regular admissions um, and all admissions included. So this is the data for once all of the results came out in March and April, you know, these um, colleges came up with their percentages of, um, you know, how many students that they accepted overall. And you'll notice like even some of these schools that had pretty high acceptance rates before, their acceptance rates have gone down a lot. Um, so you'll notice even schools like Dartmouth is hitting 6%, Columbia hit 4% this year for acceptance rate, which is very low. Emory hit 13%, which is also fairly low from previous years. And you'll see some of these other colleges that normally would have had a little bit of a higher acceptance rate have much lower acceptance rate. Vanderbilt hit 7% um, this year, which is, which is very low for them. Yale, 5%, Williams, 8%, right? Some of these colleges that you would, have, uh, you would have assumed to have a little bit of a higher acceptance rate ended up having lower acceptance rate. Um, but the thing is that I, I really want to share um, a little bit later is that not all colleges saw these changes. Changes, right? So um, I'll explain that to you a little bit more. One of the other admissions trends um, that we're seeing this year is actually wait lists. There's much more wait lists, um, students being putting on the wait list, more colleges using the wait list. Um, so they saw 80% more students on wait lists across the nation. So a lot of students who 
were on the wait list for UCLA, UC Berkeley, a lot of the UCs. Um, I've seen students on wait list for other colleges. And, you know, students ask me, well, what are the chances of me getting off the wait list this year? Um, and honestly, you know, I, I would say that wait lists are, are still very challenging in terms of getting off the wait list. Um, but the reason why colleges are using more wait lists is because there's more students applying, they have to protect their yield. So a yield means the number of applicants um, that they accept and the number of applicants that actually come to the college. So they wanna make sure that they protect that um, and that enough students come to their college um, this year, right? Or else they would kind of lose money, right? And so it's important for them to consider that. So they're putting a lot of people on the wait list so that they're protecting themselves from not having enough students come to their school as they saw last year. So last year was in the middle of the pandemic. Um, a lot of students decided to take gap years, which is one year in between high school and college where they didn't go to college and they said, hey, I'll start next year because of the pandemic. And they're like, well, I don't wanna do my first year of college at home. I don't wanna pay full tuition to have to be at home. I don't want my first year of college experience to be, to be you know, at home. And so even some of my students ended up taking gap years, which is another reason why acceptance rates might have been lower this year because they have spots saved for students who were accepted last year but decided to take a gap year so they have less students who they can accept the upcoming year so that's another thing that we can consider but wait lists are something that are going to be more used more often um, especially in the upcoming years as well the other thing um, that admissions is saying is that the characteristics and personalities of our applicants have become increasingly important. Um, so Harvard admissions said this, but a lot of other admissions um, uh, said this as well. They've said this in previous years, but they're saying this even more now. Um, and basically, as I told you earlier, because uh, more students with stellar GPAs or good GPAs and there's no more SAT or ACT or they're optional, the only other way that admissions really has to review applicants holistically is by looking at their characteristics and personalities of their applicants, which means, like I told you earlier, your application and how you present yourself in your application becomes really important. It's not just about writing the best essays. It's about writing the best descriptions for your extracurricular activities. It's basically like if you have a really, really great gift in a box, but then you wrap it like a five-year-old or my son wraps it, um, it's not gonna look good no matter how great that, that gift is inside the box. So you, all of my students and applicants have a great gift that you wanna show your, your college admissions officers. How you present that gift is gonna be so important in admissions. And I mention this almost every year, but I, I feel like this has gotten more important and more prevalent um, in admissions. How you present yourself on your applications, even the smallest questions like, are you applying for financial aid? Even the questions like, did your parents go to college, right? These questions and how you present your story and how you present yourself, the smallest questions add up to build the character that you are, to build the application and story that you wanna tell. So it's really important that you guys recognize, oh, essays, I know I have to do really good on essays. Yes, essays are really important, but beyond that, everything else you put on your application is also going to be just as important. So keep that in mind um, as you work through this. Now, the one thing I do wanna kind of mention is enrollments for new international students fell 43% this year. What does that mean? So international students who applied to college, there were less international students who applied to college in the United States this year. That is a problem for a lot of colleges. Colleges need international students. So if you are an international student or your visa status, you, you don't have your green card or re permanent residency, or you're not a citizen, you can actually expect colleges to have give you a higher chance of getting accepted because they need international applicants, right? They want international applicants. They want international students to come to their school. So you'll see it, colleges ramping up their international recruitment efforts to try to get more international students to apply. Um, and so if you are a student who are, is, is an international student, I would say, you know, in this upcoming year, your chances of getting into college could be slightly higher um, because they want more international students to come to their universities. 
So the moment we've all kind of been waiting for as we um, kind of come to an end from my seminar is the case studies this year. So this is my, my you know, students that I worked with this year. And I just kind of want to share with you the type of students who got accepted into UCLA versus, you know, higher tier school. So this is a student who had a 4.23 weighted GPA, a 3.9 unweighted GPA, and 11 AP classes by 12th grade. In fact, for the UC school system, for UCLA and UC Berkeley, you'll notice that a lot of students actually had a lot of AP classes um, that they were showing on their college applications. Um, of course, there are students who don't have 11, um, but there are students who also do really well and they've taken a lot of AP classes. This student also took all of their APs up to their 12th grade APs obviously are not included here, but they got fives on all of their AP exams. And then their top activities um, were the OC Science President, Bio Olympiad Club President, Science Fair Principal Researcher, Software Application Project Lead Developer, um, Shadowed at, at an Orthodontist um, Place, Python Coding Event Creator, and a Pianist. So he played piano as well. So a lot of really great activities. You'll notice that they have a, a lot of really great leadership positions, but also like did research and things like that. Now, this particular student's essays and teacher recommendations, so UCLA, UCs don't ask for teacher recs, but for other colleges, the student's teacher recommendations specifically highlighted their compassion for other students in the classroom. So what they did to help other people in the class. That was one of the things the teachers really highlighted for their other schools as well. Um, and then the student talked about in their essays, their impact in their community, and also their family values and traditions. I think that a lot of students use their essays to talk about like how did I do with um you know, this extracurricular activity, this is what I did as president, and this is how amazing I am, and I got Science Olympiad, and I won this award, and they try to, like, showcase all of that on their essays, but really, the students who did well this year um, for college admissions are the students who told their story, the students who told about their family values and traditions, the students that talked about the challenges that their families have gone through and where they are today because of that reason, or how their grandma taught them to make dumplings from a very young age and what that taught them about living life, right? These are the types of students that, you know, did well, um, you know, when they wrote their essays, not about the most amazing, you know, uh, competitions that you won or the most amazing community service that you did, but connecting that to your family values and traditions and your story. So that was one thing that was really important. And then this is a student um, that got accepted to Stanford. Um, and then you'll notice a 4.0 unweighted GPA and a 4.54 weighted GPA, 14 AP courses by their 12th grade. So still a lot of AP courses, but you'll notice here, which is really interesting, is that she didn't get fives on all of her AP exams. She actually got a few threes, even a four and a bunch of fives. Um, and she didn't get perfect AP scores. And I think that a lot of students think that if they, you know, want to go to Stanford or an Ivy League school, they not only need a perfect GPA, but they need perfect test scores. But I think what we realize with college admissions now more than ever is if colleges are willing to go test optional or test blind for several years, that means they're saying, hey, we find that academics is important. Um, but we really care about your GPA and your test scores are important, but we understand that your tests are just a one time thing that you take and it's not an accurate assessment of your actual academic and intellectual capabilities. That's an important point I think that a lot of students need to understand is that your GPA should always come first. You should always focus on your GPA and make sure that you're doing exceptionally well on your GPA, doing your schoolwork um, well, and then moving to kind of study for the other things as well. Of course, I'm not expecting you guys to get ones and twos on your APs and low SAT or ACT scores, but I think that at the end of the day, you know, having a couple threes doesn't mean that you're not going to get into an Ivy League school. Having a couple threes and balancing that out with really good, a really great GPA could actually be okay in terms of admissions. 
Now, some of the things that she um, had in her top activities is STEM the art, our STEM art uh, founder and president. So she created an organization where she combined her passions for art and STEM um, to teach low income students um, and combine those things together. And that's something she really loved to do because she was a musician um, as well. She also created an organization called Peers in Public Health, where she um, did invited guest speakers to come during the pandemic um, to talk about different issues in public health um, and even had like doctors and physicians and um, other people in the public health industry um, to come and speak about, you know, different types of career opportunities and, and things like that. She was also the founder and president of Hugs for Hope. She was the editor in chief of a journal. Um, she was the volunteer leader uh, for the Discovery Science Cube. She did the UCI research. These are just some of the top you know, activities she did. She did a lot of other things too, but these are things that really stood out. Now, her essays were very unique because she had a talent for creative writing. What made this student really unique and interesting, in my opinion, is that she was a STEM student and she loved sciences, but she also wrote really well. She was a creative writer. She wrote books and she wrote um, articles and journals. She had a really passion for journalism and writing, um, and she used her passions for writing to make a difference in the world, right? Um, she expanded on her STEM and humanities impact overall. And again, the student talked about her family background. She talked about, you know, what it was like at home. She talked about her car rides with her parents um, and what she learned on those car rides with her parents. Um, she kind of really dove into these areas that I feel like many students kind of leave out in their essays. Her teachers also wrote a lot about her compassion and her, her want to help with the community, um, specifically in STEM and humanities, which is really, really awesome. Um, and she highlighted that. Now, the one thing I just wanna mention really quickly about students that wanna go into top tier colleges is, you have to have a little bit of a balance, right? So you have to be really, you know, you have to be passionate for STEM and you have to show your passions for STEM or whatever direction you wanna go into. But at the same time, you should show your talents and other things. In this case, this student had a talent for creative writing and she had a talent for music, which I think adds value. And Stanford really likes like, art portfolios, music portfolios, these other portfolios that you can add to your application so that you can show um, other talents that you have. They wanna bring talented students um, to their campus. So let's talk about strategies really quickly. Um, so number one strategy um, to make yourself a more competitive applicant is impact. Impact, impact, impact. Consider the impact you're having on your community. So many of my students are like, oh, it's the pandemic, so I can't do these activities. I can't join these clubs. I can't do this, I can't do that. Take that vocabulary out of your daily conversations. Don't say, I can't. Think about how you can. What is it that you can do, right? Okay, if you think, obviously you can't play sports, well, right now things are opening back up, but if you can't do certain things, think about what you can do and utilize what you can do to make a difference. The more impact that you can have through your activities, the more valuable you're gonna be, the more you're, you're going to stand out in college admission. So this is something that's really important. Strategy number two is the importance of your senior year. Colleges are going to be putting you on wait lists, as you saw earlier, 80% more students on the wait list than there were in previous years. So you're going to need to show your senior year activities and your academics in your um, uh, letter of continued interest to get accepted off the wait list. So what does that mean? When you're on the wait list, you want to send something called a letter of continued interest. And in that letter of continued interest, you want to show college admissions, hey, this is all the stuff that I did my senior year, and I think that I would be a great addition to your college. But if you'd have nothing to talk about um, that you did your senior year because you're like, ah, oh, it's my senior year, I don't have to do anything, it's not over until it's over, right? And so you want to make sure that you're working hard throughout your senior year. And then, of course, essays and teacher recommendations have always been important, but more than ever, essays and teacher recommendations are going to be important. More than that, your teacher recommendation letters are going to be really important, especially 
for Asian American students, especially because of the pandemic. A lot of colleges know because of the pandemic, you did virtual learning. And because you did virtual learning, you weren't able to connect with your teachers as much um, because it was virtual. But despite that, were you still able to get in good relationships with your teachers? The students who have great recommendation letters are gonna have a much higher chance of getting accepted into college this upcoming year. And the last strategy I wanna tell you guys is to really consider the not so name value colleges. So I told you earlier that I was gonna give you a strategy and that there was something that, you know, not all colleges saw. Now, I told you a lot of colleges saw a lot of applicants, a rise in applicants, so many more applicants, but not all colleges saw this. So schools like SUNY, saw a 20% decrease in their applicant numbers. So if you look at US News and you look at the schools in the top 35 to top 60 or even lower than that, those colleges actually saw some decline in the number of applicants that applied, which means your acceptance rate for those colleges can go up. Right. So instead of just focusing so much on, you know, Ivy Leagues, Ivy Leagues, Ivy Leagues, I get it. Ivy Leagues are amazing, but we have to be realistic with college admissions, right? Especially in these upcoming years, what colleges are going to be the best fit for you? What colleges are going to give you the opportunities that you deserve? What colleges are going to give you the opportunities that are really great for what you want to do in the future? So consider other colleges, not just the top 10 or top 15, um, so that we can figure out um, other options and opportunities for your future. So the one thing I really want to end with, the starting point of all achievement is desire. Your desire to want it, to want to do more, your desire to want to make an impact, your desire to give back to your community, your desire to overcome challenges. The starting point of all achievement is your desire to want to achieve. So as long as you have this notion of overcoming your challenges and wanting to, over, um, wanting to achieve the best of the best um, and to do the best that you can and put all of your effort, as long as you have the desire to do it, you have the basic foundation you have the starting point to do that. So starting somewhere is really important. Even if it's the most challenging thing, the importance is starting somewhere, right? And so I wanna kind of leave our students and our parents with that. Please check us out. Check us out at the, um, at the QR code here. Um, you'll see all of these links of our services, our YouTube channel, our podcast, and signing up for our free consultation. We also have newsletters that we send out. So feel free to subscribe to our newsletter. Um, and until then, thank you so much to World Journal and everyone else um, for watching today. And I hope we can see you soon. For those of you who have questions, by the way, since this is a pre-recorded video, feel free to sign up for a free consultation and we'll answer or any of the questions you have, or you can email us at www.theadmissionmasters.com. Uh, uh, theadmissionmasters at gmail.com is also an email address that you can email us at, but you can contact us through the website as well. All right, have a wonderful weekend, and I hope we all see you soon. Bye-bye.